Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. Fossil fuel is one of the most convenient accessible sources of energy. Access to oil and gas deposits relies heavily on the utilization of oil platforms in the ocean. Building and breaking down these massive structures requires considerable effort. One of the most strategically significant offshore oil developments in Britain is the Brent Oil Field, which is located in the North Sea. After being founded in the early 1970s, the field became a vital component of the petroleum industry in the United Kingdom. To get to the offshore installations, which are around 186 kilometers northeast of the Shetland Islands, employees must make the difficult journey from Aberdeen, first flying to Sumburg, 170 miles away, and then using a helicopter for the last leg. The field, which produces gas and oil from several sites throughout its vast underwater reservoir, has proven crucial to Britain's energy security. The field development is a prime example of modern offshore technical achievement. Standing 140 meters above the water, Brent Charlie was a huge offshore structure that doubled as a drilling platform and collection hub. With its own power plant, desalination plant, and sewage system, it operated as a self-sufficient village and housed 180 workers. The platform's infrastructure, which would take up 10 acres if it was built on land, consisted of 53 cabins, a fully furnished sick bay, and 24-hour mess halls. Its 40 star-shaped, directionally drilled wells that reach 10,000 feet below the surface are what set it apart. Additionally, the platform acted as the main pumping station transporting oil to onshore terminals from all Brent platforms located across 120 miles of underwater pipelines. After operating for more than 40 years, Brent Charlie started its last step of decommissioning in late 2023. The final shutdown operations were led by Derek Deke Child, a 33-year veteran of the platform. Recovering kilometers of well piping, much of which had degraded from decades of use, was a complicated job. The infrastructure was painstakingly removed by another specialist team while adhering to tight safety regulations. Child's last order to shut down the topside processing facility was followed by a ceremony that connected present and past employees online to commemorate the final shutdown. Two more years are anticipated to be needed for the entire deconstruction procedure. Dismantling Brett Charlie's size and construction created special difficulties. Due to the severe North Sea conditions, the platform's 40 external conductors needed to be cut both above and below sea level using creative methods.
or the 162 meter legs. The crew employed high pressure abrasive water jets rather than conventional diamond wire cutting, necessitating a 50 foot descent with specialized breathing apparatus. The pioneering spirit, a ship specially built for this historic lift, was needed to remove the enormous 31,000 ton topsides. Tidal windows were crucial during transportation, and weather and waves made the precise operation more difficult. The last stage, which should have taken 18 months, was onshore dismantling and recycling. There are various other platforms in the North Sea. Dismantling Brent Bravo and Delta presented difficult engineering problems because neither platform was intended for disposal. The baseline procedure was devised and a world record was set by Delta's removal in 2017. Engineers enhanced the process for Bravo, resulting in a 70% decrease in preparation effort. They created novel shear keys instead of steel bracing by inserting 300 kilogram steel inserts into core drilled holes in the concrete legs. In a matter of seconds, the pioneering spirit ship completed both lifts, removing the 25,000 ton Bravo and the 24,000 ton Delta top sides. Over 97% of the structures were recycled when they were moved to the Iron Lady Barge and taken to Abel Seaton Port. Unlike its concrete-legged brethren, Brent Alpha's steel jacket design necessitated a special decommissioning strategy. To ensure stability against North Sea forces, Rope access technicians abseiled to produce unique castellated cuts, which were used to cut six thinner legs of the platform. Instead of using the underside lifting technique that Bravo and Delta employed, the pioneering spirit's 17,000 ton topside removal was accomplished using specially made clamps. The removal of the 10,000 ton steel jacket was the most difficult part, involving 43 underwater cuts and the setting of a new lifting record by Sleipnir, the largest crane vessel in the world. Renewable energy, such as wind farms, is seen as the way of the future, but these structures are massive. Transporting wind turbine blades possesses special logistical difficulties, especially for land routes. One such instance is the Strone Laird Wind Farm Project in Scotland, which necessitated careful transportation planning for 198 V117 blades, each measuring 57 and a half meters. To handle sharp curves and bridge parapets, McFadden's transport equipped their trailers with hydraulic necks and increased suspension. This engineering technique saved local trees and prevented expensive road upgrades.
While remote-controlled steering devices assist in navigating difficult turns and roundabouts with little impact on infrastructure, the specialized trailers may tilt and pivot to travel through intricate urban and rural routes. Specialized ships like the Orion, which can move enormous double XL monopiles up to 110 meters long and 2,000 tons in weight, are needed for the maritime transportation of offshore wind turbine components. Components for projects like the Arcadis Ost wind farm are first put together at sites along the coast before being moved by tug and barge through waterways like the Kiel Canal. The Orion can be installed in difficult locations up to 45 meters deep, where conventional jack-up vessels cannot function. Thanks to its sophisticated floating installation techniques and motion-compensated pile gripper. But floating solutions might be the better option. Scotland's Kincardine project, located close to Aberdeen, was the first to use floating offshore wind technology in 2022. In contrast to typical fixed windmills, these floating turbines can be installed in deeper waters where standard foundations are impractical since they use moored semi-submersible platforms. Before being towed to the offshore location where pre-installed mooring lines are waiting, the wind float technology allows full turbine construction at the quay side. This creative method drastically lowers installation costs by doing away with the requirement for big offshore construction vessels. The study shows how improved wind resources in previously useless deep water sites could be accessed by floating wind turbines. Assistance specialized ships called jack-up vessels are made to install wind turbines offshore. For stable installation operations, these boats, like the ones run by Fred Olson Wind Carrier, may raise themselves above the water with retractable legs. They use heavy lift cranes that can move loads up to 340 tons and transfer pre-assembled parts. Following a particular sequence, the tower must be secured to the foundation, the nacelle must be mounted, and the rotor star assembly must be attached using specialized tools, such as the rotor tilt tool. With thorough training and the power for any crew member to stop operations if safety concerns emerge, safety procedures are crucial. Installing wind farm array grid cables requires intricate networks of undersea cables that link individual turbines to offshore substations. This procedure is seen in the North Sea 1 project, where 54 monopile foundations were connected by 68 kilometers of cable laid by ships such as the Seam Amory and Seam Moxie working together. The procedure entails installing safety measures such as rock berms and mattresses at cable crossings, post lay trenching to reach a one and a half meter burial depth, and cable pull-ins at each turbine location. Power transmission from the individual turbines to the main substation via the array is ensured by this complex network. 
Installing export cables, such as the 26.5 kilometer cable system for the Nordegrund project, links offshore wind farms to onshore power systems. The first step is shore landing, where cables up to six meters deep are buried using specialist machinery like the BSS-2 trencher. The 155 kilovolt ABB export cable is laid and buried simultaneously from ships such as the Stemet 82. After horizontal directional drilling, HDD is completed for the coastal crossing. Connecting winch wires, dragging cables through HDD ducts, and ensuring the cables are buried deep enough for longevity and protection are all crucial procedures. As the world moves away from fossil fuels towards renewables, we see the challenges we face clearly. Not only does massive fossil fuel infrastructure need to be dismantled, but systems such as wind farm turbines require mega installation projects. Hopefully, these systems will become more efficient and easier to install as technology progresses. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.